Our next speaker is Ryan Adamson. He leads the High Performance Computing Security and Information Engineering Group at Oak Ridge uh, Leadership uh, Computing Facility. His group is responsible for delivering highly scalable and reliable security services, including all, you know, the telemetry and, uh, and, and those services to the staff. Uh, I've asked for a shell on one of his uh, supercomputers and he, he said no. But despite that, we'd like, to, we'd like to have him join us for this next talk. Awesome, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I guess it's gonna be hard, I think, to follow up after, after Philip's talk, um, but a lot of the things that he was talking about rang true to me, especially about you know, um, expanding your network and having you know, a GitHub where you can put write-ups and, and things. Um, and so it, it's, it's fun for me to share kind of the things that we've been doing um, with the world's fastest supercomputers to really secure them um, and, and produce great science. If you'd like to follow me, my Twitter is um, Hat Goes the Wees, and I've posted um, in the, the hallway conversation Slack a link to my um, GitHub if you want to follow along um, with some of the write ups. And so um, today, the thing that I want you to take away is if you do not have a real good like offensive security program or red team and you're looking at, at starting one up in your company, um, we did that with the arrival of Summit here at, at, uh, at our computing facility. And so I want to explain a little bit about you know, ORNL, um, give you a bit of a background on high performance computing, really what that means, and then talk about how we bootstrapped our internal offensive security apparatus and then what we're all waiting for, right, is hacking the Gibson, um, the exploits that we found and, and, and how we did it. And then finally some lessons learned. And so throughout this talk, you'll find um, references to hackers sprinkled um, because I really do feel like that's, that's me day in, day out. You know, I'm, I'm living that movie. So um, the Department of Energy funds Oak Ridge National Laboratory, but we're one of you know, many institutions across you know, the, the, the country. Um, and our mission really is to do open science. And we were started in World War II um, to develop, you know, um, science around the atomic weaponry at the time, but we're much more open science focused today. In fact, if you take all the science and you compress it into um, eight um, hexagons, uh, this is what they would look like. Um, and my hexagon in particular is this scale computing um, and data analytics at, at, at really big scales. And I support the, the security of, of those systems. On our supercomputers, you know, we don't just look for oil. Um, we also support lots of um, modeling and simulation and also artificial intelligence workloads. But I think the one that I'm the most proud of uh, has been um, supporting COVID research over the last year or two. Um, we've been able to, you know, model the SARS-CoV-2 virus spike proteins in that picture on the left there. Um, very, very, very fine detail. And it helps us understand how the, you know, how it works and possible ways to, to, to combat it, right? So this is really fulfilling for us during the pandemic, first phases of the pandemic, um, to have something to work towards um, and push through. But at the end of the day, you know, this is the Gibson for us, it's, it's Summit. Um, it is right now the second fastest world uh, computer in the world. Um, it still kept that spot um, at the supercomputing conference this week. And we really have it to, so that users can, uh, scientific users can put the biggest jobs, their biggest codes, their biggest simulations on, on it. They can't do this stuff anywhere else. They can't perform the science. Um, and so that's, that's really our mission is to deploy these huge resources. If you look back over the last, I guess, maybe 12 to 13 years or so, we have sort of this history at um, the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility of, of delivering systems. Um, the, Problem is when you know in in 2017 when we were we were getting summit is that um, we really didn't know how to really I don't know we hadn't really attacked the supercomputers before um, and so throughout my you know history I started as a systems administrator and jumped into the blue team um, side of of security I really wanted to attack these things um, to help harden them and and I I developed my skills by taking SANS training like like you know we've I had the opportunity to do um, after this. So in terms of high-performance computing, like what is it, right? Is it just a bunch of systems hooked up together? You know, it's more complicated than that. It's really like a trifecta, I would say. Um, fast compute, of course, makes sense. We use graphics processors, um, GPUs, you know, sorry that you can't buy and you get graphics cards. Um, they're probably all in um, Summit and, and Sunity Frontier. But fast compute's really important. But when you have a simulation, your compute node might be taking, you know, like a, like 10 cubic, you know, um, uh, 
a, key, a, a space in, in you know, seemingly like atmosphere or something like that, it needs to talk to the compute nodes that are assigned next to it. And so fast network lets parameters and the edge conditions, the boundary conditions be communicated very quickly between um, compute nodes. And then finally, fast storage is like the third leg of a high performance computing center. Um, you know, when a, a, a piece of hardware dies, which you have lots of in these big systems, it can set that computation quite a bit. Your job's been burning for eight hours. That's a lot of wasted work. So if you can dump your um, memory and, and stage it to disk quickly and checkpoint, you can then recover cover from failures without wasting work. And so these three pieces are super customized and, and super serial number zero. So there's a lot of cool things that we can look at and attack that aren't available um, just in the industry as, as a whole. So um, this is a diagram of a lot of the connections between different components. Uh, if you'd like to know more in detail, you know, documentation for the OLCF is, is up at this link uh, to our website. Um, basically, though, it's compute nodes are on the left here, two power nine processors, you know, are hooked to many graphics processing units. Um, and then through this network interface card, um, which we have lots of on the network, um, data can be, you know, moved very quickly down to storage. Um, and so when you're thinking about threat modeling, this, this environment, right, these pieces are important um, because this is what you're, you're you know, the, the threat that you're emulating will be looking at to try to get a crowbar in and, and, and open up. Um, the other things that are interesting about HPC is that workloads are scheduled. So it's kind of like cloud workloads where, you know, you're sharing resources, although each team would get, you know, a set, like, like they're guaranteed their own set of compute nodes when their jobs are running. You know, no one else is on those nodes. It would disrupt performance too much. But many jobs can run across the system, you know, the 4,000 compute nodes that it has at, at a time. And so that means that user separation is super important. Um, because we really only have like Linux file system permissions and Linux kernels that 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 keep that separation. You know, we don't want users to burn other allocations of other of other teams, and um, we don't want people to get the scoop on scientific research that someone else might be might be working on. But otherwise, these things are just Linux systems, and most of the offensive security tools I mean map to HPC. That's awesome. Um, otherwise, in terms of what's different between HPC, like what we do security wise and what what you find in the broader industry is that uh, performance is super important to us. You can't just drop some sort of endpoint detection and response tool that you know uh, it has a 15% um, performance hit, right? If these you know systems are $500 million to deploy, it's like that's you know quite a bit of a 60 million. Uh, $75 million of, 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 of hit, right? That you have to buy more nodes to make up for the performance impact. And so be very careful um, with what we actually instrument the system with. Um, and we can be very creative too because of, um, of the open source environments that we have. Um, again, like because these workloads are, are clustered, they're not running on one node, they're running the same application across lots of different distributed system nodes. OS level tools like Audit D and SE Linux don't really solve that big problem. They're great for localized, right? But but they're but they're you need something different for this higher layer. Um, I would also say that a lot of the tools you can drop in um, in the Windows environment, right, won't work won't work for us. So we have to kind of roll our own sometimes. Um, but that being said, like the system ends of these systems are super awesome. They're very knowledgeable, and I think I'd like. I'm sort of blessed to have them take a security first stance uh, a lot of the time, as long as it doesn't affect performance. Um, and then finally, it's if you're disclosing vulnerabilities to a vendor uh, and they would like to be paid for this really expensive system, they will work to uh, fix the vulnerability. Uh, so, so yeah, and they'll they'll work with you to disclose, which is really cool. Okay, so that was a quick primer. Um, now moving to sort of like my personal story of, you know, started out as a Linux systems administrator, jumped on the blue team, um, and around 2014, 2015 timeframe, um, we were starting to work on the very beginning of the project plan for delivering Summit. Okay, and so um, in that I was, the, I was tapped to lead the security bit of it, which was cool, and I've been taking a lot of these, you know, offensive uh, courses, I think I had, I had 560 and um, 504 at the time. Um, and I really wanted to get my hands on this. So we snuck in an activity into, um, I snuck in is not the right term, but we snuck an activity to the project schedule to really do um, a good scrub. Um, but we didn't define it so much that it looked like it might be, you know, um, threat modeling. It was really just, you know, look at the security of that. Um, and so during the project, I kind of tried to develop 
like what our strategy should be for really bootstrapping this activity and making it not just a check the list right activity, um, but really a let's let's attack this, let's lean in, let's think about the different ways you can move through the system. And the mindset here is is different than defense, right? Attackers, I've, I've seen you think in graphs where you think I'm here, data's here, how can I move you know, to get to what I want and then how do I move back out? And that's really important in this context because you have lots of components, lots of compute nodes and, and lots of ways to move throughout the system. If you're blocked at one spot, you can back up and turn and take a different path right, to get to the same, same node. Um, I also learned that you have to embrace dead ends. And this was important because um, you should expect to like hit blockers and you know, in your heart of hearts, you can, you can there's, a, there's an exploit there, but you can't figure it out. That's okay. You can step back and transition to the next point, which is always be learning. Go look at, you know, blogs, podcasts, take training. And if you remember where you've been in that attacker graph and that you've backed up from a dead end, you may realize all of a sudden have an aha insight that will help move you forward. Um, and that happened for every single one of these three vulnerabilities that I'll show you here in a minute. Um, and then the other bits of our um, of our strategy were to collaborate where possible. You know, fostering good relationships with our awesome sysadmins really helped because they leaned on the project manager and said, you know, Ryan and I think we can really uh, uh, find some interesting vulnerabilities in this. Like this, you know, this smells bad, or there's there's some hunches we have that we really want to poke on, um, and that really helped us get buy-in. Um, and so the, you know, the keynote yesterday um, that Bryson Bort gave was awesome because it's how to talk to the elephant. And I think if you can start small with a prototype and then show a little bit of value and then convert that into dollars, right, in the industry, you can really make a good case. And then finally, you know, I say prepare to find nothing. That really means is at the end of the day, you, um, um, you're the red, red team exercises are really to help the business, right? And so if you are working with your blue team and a purple combined sort of thing, people are learning. And even if you find nothing, it's like, it's a good, good, um, good experience. So in general, um, we like to scope our engagements, start from a business perspective, what are the bad outcomes for our org? And then we model the threats. And so, you know, if you're in Grand Central Station watching the movie Hackers and you've taped up the phones so that you could buy yourself more time when the FBI shows up and you're flying in to find the garbage file, like that looks exactly like this workflow um, down here. So, you know, home institution is uh, Grand Central Station and you're flying through using, you know, God as the password. And then um, you're into the, the management node and you're flying around these compute nodes, which are the big, you know, if you remember the, the, the big rectangles or whatever prisms, you know, standing up in, in space. Um, and that's what I feel like, you know, this, this really describes pretty well. Um, but each of these arrows is a boundary condition or it's a, it's a, uh, a place that trust has to happen because it's, a, it's communication between two separate parts of this distributed system. And so that's what we decided to focus on and target. Um, and again, because we really care about not having privilege escalation or users accessing other people's files, those were the things that we targeted. Okay. So the hacks, this is what you all came here for. Um, and there are three, and I think I need to go through them pretty quickly, but if you look at the write-ups, um, they go a little more in detail, and I'm happy to also have conversations after this to, to explain what we did. So just as a disclaimer, I always put this in here. Um, please make sure you're authorized and have permission. Um, you know, Philip talked about this too. Um, I, you don't really want a felony, so just, okay. So the first thing that uh, we found uh, was, is something called EAuth credential spoofing. Um, it, it is a vulnerability in this arrow, number two right here, where um, on a login node, a user, a scientific user that wants to run climate simulation or something will batch up their work and they'll submit it to the scheduler. Okay, and they use a tool called BSUB to do that. But BSUB asks for a token from this privileged binary, right? And the token comes back and that represents you. And then your, that token is sent with the workload to the scheduler. The scheduler does the same thing. The tokens match, must have been you, right? So, you know, EAuth is binary and clearly it uses your user ID or something like that, right? To, to generate um, this, this token. And so um, I think the first sort of aha insight here is that um, the tokens look pretty weak. So, you know, maybe in, if this is a password, I mean, it's got special characters, that's good. It's got numbers, uh, but there are no upper or lowercase, you know. Um, if you've done anything with cryptography, right, the key space is super important. 
Um, and this looks pretty short and is really just numbers and a couple of you know special characters. So already you can be thinking like, should I can I try to you know brute force this or, or whatever? But honestly, it's pretty lazy. Um, I'm, I'm lazy and brute forcing sounds hard and I don't know how to reverse engineer what EAuth is really doing under the hood. Um, I'd like to be able to do that someday. Um, so what we just tried to do is this thing called the LD preload trick. All right. So if you're running code on a, in a Linux environment, you can um, tell the dynamic uh, loader to sort of shim your own custom libraries in front of the ones that would have been linked or loaded right um, for your binary. And so when you do that, you can change all kinds of functions that would have been called, such as um, get UID and uh, get EUID. And so that's what we tried first. So here, 2872 is the user ID of my friend in the uh, you know, security, um, uh, really more of the policy side, risk management framework side. Clearly, you know, wouldn't really be logging into the system to run, run code, um, and, but I also got his permission, so that's good. Uh, unfortunately, when you try to use this LD preload trick uh, to overwrite what uh, the, the, the user ID would be, um, the loader knows that you're not root, but EOP has the set UID uh, bit set. And so um, it doesn't let you use LD preload. Um, so that was kind of the first roadblock that we came up. Darn, I really wanted to use this trick, um, but is there some way we can remove that set UID bit from the binary? Turns out we have read access um, and we can just copy it to our home area, um, right? And then, and then hack on that. <clears throat> and so um, you'll see in a little bit the, the, uh, us doing that in the demo. But then once we showed that, yes, we can get someone else's secret. The, the question is, how do we use that secret to actually gain control of, of a process for, uh, as that were submit a job on their behalf? Um, and, and then again, I'm lazy. And I really didn't want to reverse engineer the B sub job submission protocol with the LSF scheduler. It's closed source. It's just like, oh gosh. But if you want to live off the land, you know, uh, let's just use what we already have. Um, and another kind of cool technique that's called out, oh, I forgot to mention, um, the, the blog post that tuned me in um, was, was this down here. So check that out. It's really cool about the LD preload trick. Um, one of the things that we decided to do is to take any calls that were coming through to the system installed EAuth way up here and you know, opt IB on Spectrum Computing LSF and replace that string with my copy of EAuth, right? That will let me preload in front of it. And so those two things together um, let me get the, the token of the end user and then I can, these are I'm targeting and I can submit the job and it'll run as them. So I get access as them to the system, which is not what we want. In terms of how we you know, looked at this stuff, um, intuition wise, anytime you see risky design patterns or crypto craft or weirdness, um, you should you know, think as if there's a hunch there that I can, I can get at this. We also had our systems administrators tell us that they thought this was a problem. And when they tell you that something's insecure, you should believe them and, and push on it. And it's great. So once I exploited this, um, our, our admin ran down the hallway like, Ryan, Ryan, guess who's running code? It's, it's, uh, it's our, our policy person. It's really cool. He's using the supercomputer. Like, no, it's, it's me. I'm doing it. It's him. So um, it's cool to loop them into these kinds of activities, right? In terms of researching and, and exploiting this, like testing, having a test lab for tinkering is super important. We use a system called Peak, which is uh, set up to be Summit's testing and development system. Um, knowing how to do Linux process tracing and really looking on the web for, for research, it's, it's important. Um, and then I guess finally, like the LD preload trick we talked about, be creative, you know, and be lazy. I think these things are what, uh, what make up are, are the, the threats that we're modeling in the first place. So feel free to, to, to be like them. So putting it all together, here's what we have. And so I'm SSHing into peak. And I'm going to jump into my temporary directory. Um, and so I've already had an S trace output where I'm showing that, you know, the EOT binary is located there and I'm running it a bit. So you can see those, those tokens pop out. I'm now gonna copy the system EOT into my local air, uh, directory here. And then I'm gonna run both of them at the same time, the system one and my local one to see that they do have the same token that they, that they generate. And those pipes sort of separate the two. Um, and so at this point, um, I've already got my um, LD preload library code there. So I build it and I, I set it to be, you know, uh, linked by the, by the loader. Um, and you can see here that 
the tokens are different after I um, after I set that. And so at this point, I'm going back and I'm going to build um, the exec VE call to preload that as well, and I can submit a job. And it comes back, and I'm this user on um, on the compute node. So um, again, this is pretty quick for the short time frame of this talk, but on the um, the write up is out there, and, and feel free to ask questions later. All right. So the next one is um, a flaw we found in a tool called uh, Burst Buffer. This is intended to let users pre-stage their data. So even though our big file systems are super fast for checkpointing, um, a lot of the time when you run a job, you might spend you know, the first good 10% of your time that you've allocated spooling data from disk into memory. Um, and that, that you know, is sort of a waste of computational resources if you're not running stuff on the GPUs. So Burst Buffer was a tool that users could pre-stage data from the big file system into NVMEs local to the compute nodes. Problem is that there was a lot of rapid development and burst buffer um, tooling shipped with some set UID root binaries that uh, we picked up again using techniques that we learned in, in 504 and, and 560. Um, so one of these set UID root binaries was called stage in underscore admin. And it, uh, it really was for developers to test the client, being, the client tooling for, for burst buffer before the proxy had really been built all the way. It just remained packaged in um, with the with the tool um, and so we started to look at this we're pretty sure we can poke on it uh, and it runs a Perl script <laughs> so this is a set UID root binary that runs a Perl script which doesn't sound quite right and we've been knocking on Perl a lot um, I think this conference um, so that's probably all I'll say about that but um, it also takes a user defined environment and users can tell this stage in admin command, the code they want it to run to stage their data for them. So there's like user defined control that's being passed to a set UID root program. Um, and I think somebody realized this because care was taken in the Perl script to like detect if people were, you know, in the set UID context or if they had dropped permissions, but permissions weren't handled quite right. And um, turns out you can, you can use that. So the first problem that we encountered exploiting this was really just with the, um, um, the amount of environment variables we had to create and the different ways you could run the code. Um, unfortunately, there was no real aha insight here. You got to dig out Perl for dummies. Um, there are Perl modules that would be called and execution would pass back and forth. And I'm just not a very good Perl person. I mean, I guess what's nice is that because it's an interpreted language, you can, you can read it when it's on disk, right? And it's readable in like the RWX sense, maybe not the, the Perl sense, right? But um, trial and error really got us to figure out a way to get to um, a code execution path that, that would run our code. And then this is kind of a minor trip up that I always hit. I forget to um, call set UID zero to ask the kernel to really make me, you know, stay root when I run my thing, my next you know, bit of code. So um, this is something I think even in the demo, you'll see me forget to do this. So um, and so, so putting this all together, this is actually pretty simple to exploit. It just took a lot of futzing to get the Perl script um, to go down the right execution path to where they would, uh, where it would run our code that we wanted it to run. Again, there's a risky design pattern here, and um, and and the broadly scope set UID binary um, is just when you see that, you just know you can probably you know probably get something out of it. Again, we had a test lab for tinkering that's super important for everything, and Clearbox code review was was really awesome. And then. You know, finally, developing just trial and error and exploitation um, with, with C and C++ was, was how we got this to work. We put it all together. Um, I log into a compute node. I've got to submit a job using dsub first to get um, a job to run on a compute node. And I'll look for it. And the, the node here is called H41N07. Uh, so I'm going to jump to that. And I'm setting my environment variables. And then for this particular exploit, you know, we wanted to set up Netcat to see what that looked like from a flow perspective, um, so we could tune some of our signature detection. Um, so, so that's what I'm going to do here. I think, you know, most folks would agree if you see Netcat listening on port 9999, <laughs> um, and people are connecting to it, maybe that's that's an indicator of compromise. Not sure, um, but we were trying to be loud so that we would give um, get some good signatures out of what you know what exploitation would look like from this resource. And so uh, we build that, 
and I forgot a thing. So if, you, if you're following along at home, you might have seen my mistake. Um, but I'm going to set that binary that we compiled um, to be the thing that is executed. So I remember my mistake, and it's to actually become root. But I also forget the semicolon, and I don't know. I, I make mistakes all the time. I think that's part of it. Um, if you're perfect, like I'd like to learn from you, but I seem to have to bang my head against things for quite a while. And so I'm going to go ahead and run um, that and start a listener, and I can connect to it. And I'm root. And at this point, I was like, what can I do? I can Etsy shadow. Then I thought maybe I'll be showing this to some conference full of you know 2,000 attendees, and I don't want password hashes dumped in the open, so I didn't do that. All right, and so the third one, how are we doing on time here? I think we're okay. So the third um, vulnerability that I wanted to show is is also in this burst buffer tooling, but um, later on there was a proxy that would run on each of the compute nodes that users could communicate with to kind of do this data transfer without having to interrupt whatever the you know, other person's code was running on, on, on the compute node. Um, and so it was pretty well written, really. Um, and, but it was open sourced, which is really cool. Like thanks to Department of Energy, um, we're very, have, a, have a very a strong open source culture. Um, and just by looking through the, the Git, GitHub repo, um, which is the IBM Cask GitHub repo, if you want to take a look at that, um, we looked at some popens and, and found some interesting um, calls out to arbitrary commands. Uh, command injection vulnerabilities. So in this particular case, you know, this is error handling code and a lot of issues are found in error handling code because I don't think people go there. It's kind of like a dusty old closet, you know, that um, you only open up once in a while to get the vacuum cleaner out, right? And in this case, if if this error code called eBusy, which means the file system is, is busy, um, it would try, first buffer would, the proxy would try to run an LSOF, which is a listing of open files on whatever the thing was that was uh, the file path that was being operated on. Turns out that these percent S's here uh, are string, you know, substitutions. Um, and so the attacker has full control over what they name their file system directories. And uh, we can use this to get um, command injection. So this is, I think by far this is the coolest um, one of the three to me. Um, unfortunately, eBusy's aren't very often thrown, um, and so we had to be kind of creative. Um, someone early made the point that uh, there is no cheating in offensive security, um, and I, I, I agree with the sentiment. Um, I think, though, that there is cheating. It's just okay to cheat, right? Attackers will cheat, so we should be able to cheat. So we cheated uh, by asking the admins to stand up um, Fuse, which is a user space file system statement. And we wrote a fuse file system that all it did on removal of directory would be to throw uh, eBusy errors, right? So, so if we can create a directory inside of our fuse file system that we can get BB proxy to remove, it will get an eBusy and then it will execute that LSOF, right? So it's kind of like funky and weird. I think this aha insight took, I don't know, probably three months of me stuck on this dead end, this attacker graph node before I, I saw the blog post about uh, the Python Fuse file system um, and, um, and FusePy, which is cool, cool resources. So take a look at that write up. So then um, the second roadblock we ran into were just semicolons and path names, which are gross. Um, we ended up putting uh, like, 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 you know, forward slashes in, in particular, you can't name your files with forward slashes, you have to escape them first and then things don't resolve quite right um, in, inside of that LSF command. So we actually did shell expansion and shoved that uh, onto the name of the file <laughs> on the file system. So if you see files on the file system named this, maybe that's an indicator of compromise. Um, and then finally, we wanted to get a shell on the system. Um, and you know, so we were just used SSH. Um, Host-based authentication is set up. And so we can SSH you know, as root into the local host as root and get a nice full featured shell. Um, and that's what we did in this one. So. Log into Peak and and get a compute node going. All right, and that's H forty one N ten this time. So we'll SSH there, and we'll create our own fuse pile fuse file system. Here's that remove dir function that we are causing to throw eBusy errors, um, and so we'll set it up, and we will write some files, and hopefully. Um, we can read them from this fuse file system to make sure it works. So writing some files in the source. 
and we see them there. So um, our fuse file system is working. So we're going to create our, our um, directories. Um, and of course, we make mistakes all the time on the command line, so that's okay. Um, I need to wrap this in the shell expansion um, language so that the LSOF command expands that out to be my, my, my chmod command. Um, and here, instead of creating a shell directly, I, I decided to change the permissions of um, the Chonin chmod commands, which manipulate file ownership and permissions on a Linux system. Um, and so I'm showing you here that they're, they're set sort of normally. Um, but when I remove these directories that I've created, we should create, we should make them set UID root, meaning anybody on the system can use them and, and really manipulate any file. So I'm building um, my SSH shell here and I run it to show that it does work, cool. And now I think we're ready to actually um, exploit this thing. So bbcmd is the command that talks with the first buffer proxy. I'm gonna use it to remove, um, this arm there is a remove, remove a directory, which it will happily do. And if you notice, there's a, an error, which is device or resource busy. So that threw an busy, which is great. Chmod is now set UID root, which is scary. Chon is also, if you ever see this on a system, it is bad. Uh, <laughs> you don't want that. So now we can run uh, Chon and Chmod and change our shell to be owned, set UID owned by root. And then um, we can use it to log in locally. And then we can get to the management node as root. So that's like total compromise, really bad. So hopefully those are interesting um, vulnerabilities and exploits associated with them. Um, intuition here, again, risky design patterns, look at them. You know, new, new tools, like you gotta be careful um, and you gotta push on, push on the vendors to make them better. Um, there was a lot of good code, but Cruft is where you wanna look um, for, for weird, funky things. And then um, in terms of the, the vulnerability research we did here, test lab's important. Always, always have a test lab. Um, again, Clearbox code review is super awesome. Um, it's nice that it was open source. We were able to find this. If it was closed source, we probably would, would have taken a lot longer to find something like this. Um, and then in terms of, you know, the exploit development and exploitation, this is really like shell injection and Linux file system naming and C, C++ and, and you know, guts of, of file system error conditions. So it's very Linux heavy here, but, um, but, but essentially I think being creative is, is, is the most important thing to take away. So overall, we found 10 things that we fixed or took action to mitigate. Um, the only other publicly disclosed vulnerability that, that we got out of this is a GPFS denial of service. Um, so maybe I can talk about that some other time. And so just, I guess, overall, in terms of like lessons learned, um, you can do this sort of thing with enough practice. You absolutely can. In 2014, I wasn't some shell commander, stack buffer overflower, reverse engineer, rock chainer person. I think I knew what those terms meant. I know I wanted to be one of those people. I'm still not one of those people. I'd love to be, but I don't feel like a fit. But it's like, I, I wasn't there for sure, to, you know, 2014. Um, I did get a lot of benefit out of taking the SANS, you know, 504, 560, and 660, and, and studying and, and passing the GXPN. That was really awesome. Um, I think intuition and creativity are super important because it really helps you flesh out the different areas of that, of that attacker graph, right? You see nodes, you see paths that other people haven't seen, and that's how you find exploits. Um, I guess I would also say here that people from non-security fields, right? Like software development, engineering, systems administration, psychology, economics, can be crucial in linking together two nodes of this attacker graph, right? I mean, if you think about the way that uh, crypto, uh, not crypto mining, shoot, um, Ransomware, right? And crypto ransomware is, has changed. It's, it's not about taking your data and stealing it. It's about keeping you from getting access to your data. And now that there are economics behind it, it's, it's becoming a really big problem. And so you can have really cool intuition from different backgrounds, and that's super important. Um, you know, dead ends are going to happen. It's a part of life. It doesn't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean you don't know what you're doing. It doesn't mean you failed. I mean, sure, other people may be able to do it better, but you're the one doing this work. Remember where you've been and Keep an open mind. You might be able to come back and, and carry it and, and, and seal the deal, right? And then this final slide here, all security organizations can benefit from an internal, continuously engaged offset security program, right? I mean, it, and the way that we do it here at the OLCF is, is it's really integrated. You know, we're red, we're blue, we're purple. Um, it's not particularly formal, but I think that 
the combination of skill sets across blending, across you know attack, really helps the defense side, especially if you're coming from the same pool of of um, like shared responsibility, right? The same mission of keeping your company safe. Um, I think vendors can be great to work with. I think they can also be terrible to work with. But of course, when you have leverage um, and and they want to be paid, they will um, uh, make reporting easy and they will fix the things that you find. And then finally, you know, we weren't the only national laboratory getting a system like Summit. Other labs were getting systems. Other, in, you know, people in industry were getting these Power9 architectures. Um, and so, getting CVEs for the really big things helps them know that they're vulnerable um, because sometimes you don't update system software for a long time in HPC environments. And so knowing that you're vulnerable to something is really important. Um, and that's kind of how you can be a good steward right back to the community um, if that's what you want to do. I think that's it for me. So let's continue the conversation. Again, follow me on Twitter if you'd like um, and hit up my GitHub. Um, and remember, hacking is more than just a crime. It's a it's a survival trade. <laughs>